Hey, welcome to Taylor's Trick Taking Table. I'm taking a trip to the East Coast. So that's why you're seeing me in my daylight version <laughs> right now. It is the middle of miscellaneous, subset, giveaway May, subset, Ray May, because <laughs> the games we're covering today are both by Chris Ray, who created the BGG Guild for the trick taking. Definitely go check that out. It's a wonderful place to uh, chat and learn about all these different trick-taking games and news and people sharing ideas and it's, it's such a great forum. But we are covering two of his games. We've covered Letter Tricks in the Past and February by, by him. And uh, the two games we're covering are Magic Trick and T8. I talked a little bit about T8. It's named after the convention, the T8 convention. So check out the, the vlog for a little bit on that. But the hooks to them are Magic Trick is a game where like no one sees <laughs> no one sees the cards that are dealt. They're all kind of sorted and then face down, uh, but you know the suits on the back. So it's must follow so everyone follows, but you don't quite know what your hand is. It's sorted before you get it by the person to your right from strongest to weakest. So when you play a card, you kind of know that everything to the left of that card is stronger and everything to the right is weaker. <laughs> it's a great hook. I don't know if I'm doing it justice, but yes, it'll make sense in the how to play. And then the T8 is a game with eight suits, and it's must not follow, but there's eight suits, and it's kind of a little bit of a, a puzzle because it, it's, it's both at four players and one player. There's a solo <laughs> version of this, and I'll teach, I'll teach both. And it's, I think Chris said it was the only game designed, trick-taking game designed in Antarctica, or only game designed in Antarctica. Either way, pretty wild. But so the game we're gonna give away because it's giveaway May for 1855 subscribers. What? Still blows me away. I found a copy of a game I covered a long time ago on the channel because it's been a few years. It was one of the first few episodes, I think, uh, was Ugly Christmas Sweaters by Hunter. So if you wanna know how to play, check that out. And if you want this copy, I thought it'd be fun to ask because uh, at T8, I talked to Eric Martin of Eric Martin fame, <laughs> BGG and, and all that, about sorting hands. And you'll see in that kind of vlog how much I talk about sorting hands and that idea of in a trick taker or climbing shedding game, like whether you sort your hand or not. And he didn't sort his hand. He doesn't even sort his hand like in the mind, just like any game, he does not sort his hand. So what I'm wondering, if you want a copy of Ugly Christmas Sweaters, put in the comments whether you sort your hand or not. And if you pay attention to where people pull cards out, of their hand and whether you glean information off that. And kind of a, I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but a subset of that, I'm wondering, do you pay attention to when someone's like, when someone leads a suit and it's must follow and they're just like playing with that one card or like they'll pick the card up and just like put it face down because you know it's like the only card they can play or like how quickly they play a card. Do you pay attention to that? I'm curious, it's interesting. I think it's an interesting discussion, but anyway, Put that down in the comments. I'm curious to hear what you think. And let's go to the table. I'm gonna teach you how to play these two. And then, for final thoughts, I'll be in the East Coast. So you're gonna see me on a different time zone. Pretty fun. Bye, catch you later. The deck in Magic Trick is made up of seven suits, numbered zero through seven. And importantly, you can see the suit on the back of every card. Here we have the game almost set up for three players. So depending on the player count, you're gonna remove some cards. So at three players, you're gonna remove two suits that aren't hearts because hearts are trump in the game and a random card, which you're gonna show everyone. So we're just gonna take this off the table. And then every player is gonna get dealt 13 cards. And these are gonna be the cards that are for the player to their left. So in this game, part of setup is you're going to sort the player to your left's cards from highest to lowest. The hand is going to, again, go from zero to seven. But so players, you know, and obviously not open like this because the other player's not supposed to see, we're gonna sort it and it doesn't matter what you do suit-wise. Like for example, there's these two threes here and they can go in either order. It kind of just is up to whoever's sorting. As you can see here, now we have finally sorted, Ness has sorted for the star their hand so six all the way down to zero and so i like to kind of just put the high side on the top and pass this to the other player so then the other player is going to get their cards like this and they're going to splay them out kind of like this where the highest number is 
on the side with the high side card. So now the player knows, they don't know what ranks they have, uh, but they do know that like their lowest rank, or one of their lowest ranks, because you know they don't know how many zeros they have, or ones or whatever it may be, is over here, and then their highest is over here. So I've sorted the rest of the hands, and again, there's the high card showing that over on that side is the highest cards, and then these would be the weakest. Play starts with the person left of dealer. Let's say it's Ness here. They can play any card from their hand. Remember, hearts is trump in the game. And so maybe to deduce a little bit about their hand, Ness is just gonna play one of the cards from the middle to kind of learn about. So they can play any card they want, and they just played a three. So again, Ness didn't know what rank it was, just the suit. So they played a three. So now they know that everything to the right of where they played, so I'll just move that so you can kind of visually see, is going to be three or lower, and then everything to the left is three or higher. After playing a card, a player has an action, which is kind of how they bid, but I'll explain that in a little bit. For now, let's just continue this trick. And so it's a must-follow game, so coming to the start, they would have to play their only green, so since they played their five, they know that to the left is either five or higher, and they don't they only have two cards to the left, so they know maybe they don't have the highest of hands. And then this player, they could play this, they know it's like probably a seven if it's like their highest card. So they're wondering, do I want to win a trick or do I want to possibly lose a trick? And since they're not quite sure what's gonna happen, maybe they're just gonna play this middle one here. And so this was a six. So that was very surprising for them because they thought they were gonna lose the trick by playing in the middle here, but they actually won it. So now they know that they have kind of a stronger hand. And in fact, they know for 100% that this is the seven in green clovers. So they're gonna collect to the trick and then lead to the next trick. Maybe they're like, hmm, let's see if this is also a six, the, the, the purple. It was, interesting. So now, uh, again, it's a, it's a must fall game and, and players are just playing to the trick. This player right here thinks they probably can win it with a seven and they <laughs> were wrong. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, the tricks will play out like this where you don't really know your ranks and you're kind of just uh, learning and slowly deducing. But after you play a card, so let's say, just for an example here, uh, Kiki plays this four. So after you play a card, you can choose one of the cards in your uh, kind of display here as your bid. So maybe Kiki knows like this is like a six or a seven or something like that. So she's gonna keep the heart because she wants a high heart to maybe win more tricks. So she's gonna flip this and say, this is my bid. She wanted a six, got a seven, uh, but she's like, meh, maybe we'll try to make it work. This is the number of tricks that she now has to hit. And so this is not a card in her hand anymore. This is her bid. So maybe I'll just put that you know, over here by her high side. So now she's trying to hit seven tricks. Mm, doesn't look too hot because she doesn't have too many more trumps, but we'll see how it goes. So again, it's must follow. So coming down to this player, they'd have to play their only triangle, boop. And then this player over here, maybe they play this middling triangle, which they think is, and it was, is gonna win it. So play like this is gonna continue where players are playing to the trick and possibly choosing one of their cards after they play to the trick to be their bid. If you don't choose, it's just the last card in your hand. But let's jump forward to the end of the hand to talk about scoring. Here we are at the end of the round and players are going to score three points if they hit their bid exactly. So up here, the star, they got three tricks and they bid three, so they're gonna get three points. And if you miss your bid by any amount, you just lose the points for the difference. So over here, Ness, they bid four but got five, so they're gonna lose one point from that three. So they're just gonna make two points for their bid. And then over here, Kiki bid seven, <laughs> only took four. So they're actually gonna get zero points for their bid. Importantly, you can bid zero in the game by using one of the zero cards and then taking no tricks. Finally, there's something called a prestige bonus. So in all of the tricks that you won, you're going to look at how many suits you took. So in this case for Ness, they took one, two, three, four. So if you, hit the number of suits as your bid as well, you're gonna get a prestige bonus. So they got four suits, they bid four, so they're gonna get it, so that's two bonus points. So they actually got four points for the whole round. But as you see over here, even though the star got three tricks, they got four, five suits, 
or so. <laughs> so they didn't get a prestige bonus, so they'll get zero for that. So even though they hit their bid, they didn't hit their suit bid. So Ness actually did better than the star. The prestige bonus also counts if you bid zero, like let's say Ness bid zero and then didn't take any cards, that counts as well. So the best you can do in each round is five points. You're gonna play rounds equal to the number of players and whoever has the most points wins. If it's tied, whoever hits the prestige bonus most wins. And if that's still tied, tie players share the victory. The deck in T8 is eight suits, one of the suits is kind of like a multi-suit, numbered zero through seven. A game of T8 can be played with four players or as a solo game alone. I'm gonna teach the four player game now. So players are dealt 16 cards each. After the deal, you're gonna secretly pass three cards to the player to your right. The start player for the first strike is left a dealer. Let's say it's the name tag here. So in the game, when you are leading, you can play any two cards of different suits or of the same suit. So let's say, the Taylor main badge player here played a star and a spade. So they played four of each. The game is must not follow. So coming to the dealer token here, they can play any two cards, they just can't be star or spade. The wilds are able to be played at all times and they count as kind of all colors. And so maybe they play the five triangle and then the zero triangle, just to show that, again, you can play two of the same suit if you wanted to. So coming to the paper over here, they can play any two cards, they just can't be triangle, star, or spade. So maybe they play a five clover and a two moon. And then finally, coming to the matchbox, they can now play, they can play hearts still, or diamonds and wild. So let's say they played a five of hearts and a three of diamonds. The winner of the trick is whoever played the highest sum. So you're gonna add up the two values. So like this person played eight, five, seven, and then eight. If it's ever a tie, it's whoever played earlier into the trick. So the winner of the trick is gonna take their lowest card and it's gonna go face up into their score pile as positive points. If it's a tie like it is here, you just pick one. It doesn't really matter. So the press badge over here is going to have four positive points. We're gonna make sure to keep it face up because any cards that were played that were lower than the card that was scored, but not equal to, are going to be flipped face down as negative points into that person's score pile. So like the zero here, I mean, it's a zero, so it doesn't quite matter, but that's gonna be flipped face down into the score pile for the poker chip. This two is gonna go face down for the paper, and then the three is gonna go face down for the matchbox. So this is minus three points, you know, minus two, minus zero for that player. You're gonna collect all these cards. These are just gonna get discarded out of the game. And then the player who won is then gonna to lead to the next trick. So maybe they play like a five in the multi-suit and then a two spade. Multi-suits can be played whenever. It's not important that another multi-suit was played. Like this player right here can play, you know, a seven multi-suit and then also a five. If you ever can't play to the trick because it is must not follow, like let's say this was in a much lighter example and the paper over here only had this hand where it's filled with only stars and spades. And as you can see, a spade and a star has already been played into the trick. You can pick any two cards in your hand and flip them face down as scoring into your score pal. So again, you lose points for face down, so they would be losing one point here because they're picked the zero and the one. And that is effectively your turn. And play would continue to the next player. Interestingly, in the game, you can actually optionally do that if you want to. So you don't always have to play to the trick if you can. Fast forwarding to the end of the round, players are going to grab their score pile and they're going to lose points for every face down card and get points for every face up card. So this would be six points minus seven. So this player lost one point. Then you're gonna play four total rounds and whoever has the most points at the end wins. For the setup for the solo game, you're gonna split out all of each suit into its own pile. You're gonna make four players with two suits each in their deck. For the other three players, you're gonna shuffle those suits together, flip them and have just like a deck of two suits each. And then for you, you're gonna also have two suits, but you have access to all the cards at the start of the game. So you're just gonna kind of splay them out. The wilds are just gonna be treated like any normal suit in a solo game. With those decks now shuffled, you're going to draw two cards each from each of the piles. And you're gonna do this every trick. The game's gonna last eight tricks in total. And the gameplay is just like in the four player where the winner is whoever has the highest sum and the loser is gonna take any low cards that they played as minus points. So for example here, if we just played a zero and a one, 
And just like in the original game, you can play two of the same suit if you wanted. The winner would just look at their score. So 11 over here, because they played higher than anyone else. They're gonna take their lowest into their score pile for positive points. And anybody who played lower is gonna lose that many points. So like we would just lose one point here, this player over here would lose one point, and then up here, this player lost two points. You're gonna collect anything else, just discard it, and then that player is gonna effectively lead the next trick. And so this is just gonna happen again for all of those eight tricks. Any ties are going to go to the automated players. You never win any ties. But how you do in the game is if at the end, if your positive points are higher than the other Automa player's negative points. And so you have to beat all the other three automated players and you have to get positive points yourself. And zeros don't count. So if you get a zero or if any of them get a zero, you don't win. And that's how to play the solo mode. So that was T8 and Magic Trick. I am currently at an Airbnb, as you can tell by these wonderful quotes behind me and the fact that I have two Metro cards. So if that doesn't show you that, I am a tourist who doesn't know what he's doing. I don't know what would. But let's start with T8. And this was a gift by Chris to everyone who, who went to T8, like I mentioned, which was so, so wonderful. And it's interesting to see a game with eight suits. I found that uh, eight suits is kind of a lot to sort into your hand. I, I wonder if this game would be a little bit easier to manage online. But I do find that it's interesting to have must not follow, but have a ton of suits to play. And I noticed that sometimes players, when it was their turn to play, they would either try to get out of their way to play two suits, just to make it harder for the players later on, but also the fact that there are so many suits and it's must not follow, there's just a lot of calculation of like, what can you play? Players, especially like third or fourth, because it's you know only a four player game, except for the solo, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. I thought that there's just like a lot of calculation, like, okay, so what can I play? Especially when you're later in the trick. It's weird to say there's like, it's not really fiddly, but it's just, there's a lot of like, what can I play? And oftentimes the answer is, you're forced to play these two cards, or these, one of these, or two or th three or four options in your hand. Or, worst case, worst case is, you can't play, and you're gonna score negative. And I've noticed it is a brutal game. <laughs> and one where, I think the passing at the start helps, but there are just a lot of like obviously good cards, like two sevens, just good. Two zeros, good. In fact, it's interesting to have both highs of a suit good and the lows of a suit good. I've never seen a game where like just the middles are bad. And sometimes it's like, I think the, the, the flow of the hand is like, when do you get rid of those middles? When do you take the negative points? But Oftentimes, if you mistime that, you're just in for a really, really bad hand. <laughs> um, or if you're just not dealt a lot of suits, you're kind of in for a little bit of a rough hand. So it's an, it's an interesting game. There's like some fun things to manage, but I found that I think it's a little too calculating, as in like, what can I play for my tastes? And then also a little bit too um, negative for my tastes. A lot of players were scoring just a ton of negative points. So interesting and like really cool to see must not follow with so many suits but a little less trick ticking like flow and more just like what can i play and again like online or like an app of this where it's like it would just tell you what you can play that'd make this really smooth but so the solo version of t8 i liked it more there's a lot of cool choices where it's essentially the best parts of the four player game in the solo version. It's a little bit much when you're like kind of setting up all the decks and like flipping over everything and kind of resetting up everything and trying to keep track of like four score piles, especially with like the face down and the face up. Um, so it's a little bit fiddly and a little bit like um, much to keep track of, but it is really fun. So I think as a solo game, this was really, really cool. Um, I love like Sprawlopolis. Uh, there's a lot of button shies that, that I'll play solo a lot. And this does a really good job of what I love in a solo where you can try to win or not but also try to beat a score. So Sparlopolis is just kind of win or not, but I kind of do like a little bit of the high score that maybe like Orchard has or something. But yeah, I thought it was a good entry into the solo series around kind of like a Gongor Wist uh, in terms of like benefit for, you know, juice out of the grind. I still think, you know, Horde Northwood is one of the best in this. So it's hard to compare to something that I think is just so sensational. But I think as an entry into the solo, kind of sphere, it, it does a good job. And the one I liked a little bit more, which was Magic Trick, I thought it was really cool. There's some comparisons to Luz, which I don't think is too similar. Like, 
at all. I, uh, there's a little bit of the kind of mentality of Les where, you know, you're going off of the card backs and you can't see your cards, but the fact that like no one can see their cards and it's actually like very card county and very deduction based, I thought this was really interesting. The fact that also you have to pick one of your cards as your bid and the number of suits that you're trying to collect is super great. I love that part. That was my favorite part of the game. There's something to a game where when you have kind of like two bids, especially in the way that Magic Trick does it in a really smart way. I always like games where there's like initial scoring and then players reveal something and you have like a second round of scoring and they're like, ah, who wins? And it's cool to see that in this game where you're trying to hit your bid of how many tricks you get. But, and I think this is just because it's so <laughs> to like count cards and like make sure you, you know where your strength is in your hand. Uh, it's so much like mentally taxing that you're actually not paying attention to how many suits you get, or at least I wasn't, and like most of the players I were playing with weren't, to the point where uh, when you hit your bid or not, it, there's some flexibility there. So like you might get like a point, or like if you hit it correctly, you might get a couple points or a few points. But my favorite thing in this game is when after you check your bid, you dig through the cards that you got and you try to get that suit, that suit bonus. And it's so much fun. It's almost like, it feels like at the end of Ticket to Ride to be like, okay, we scored like all the train being laid down scoring, but then what were, you, what were your ticket scores, you know? And it has that kind of feeling in a game where it's like, what are your end game scoring? I, I, I loved it, it was great. So I think if you're gonna like Magic Trick, you kind of want to be into deduction and knowing where you played cards from and paying attention to that and I thought the shooting the moon was also great. There's some really fun tension to that. It's just, it's a lot of paying attention to things at the table, which I think is great. I always love in a trick taker where you focus on what everyone plays as opposed to just what you play. So uh, magic trick was good. It just, if you <laughs> like counting cards and paying attention to that. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Uh, Chris is, he's, he's one of the people that we've covered most on the channel and so it's always great to see what he comes out with, especially because February is always gonna have new rules every year. So I'm super excited to see what he comes out with next, but thanks so much for watching.